You can be mean as well. Like, I think I can take it. I can pause and have a cry break <laughs> if I need. Some emails I'll send an email and I'll see, like, I see a thousand clicks in like two minutes or something, for example. At the time, it was very successful. But I had no idea what the possibilities were. It just like reminded me of my childhood days when I was doing these things in the, during the holidays, you know, these little exercises <laughs> from school. Uh, I really like that. So I ran it as an influencer style business for far longer than I should have. I just want as many ideas as possible uh, so that I can chuck away the bad ones. Do you want to learn how to build a repeatable, manageable system to actually make social media generate big bucks for you? And I'm not talking about spamming shitty AI images to boomers on Facebook or on Pinterest. I'm talking about building a real business that will survive platform changes unlike many tactics that are floating around these days. My guest today evolves in one of the most competitive markets that I can think of, online English lessons. Lucy started eight years ago with nothing except for her camera and her bubbly personality. And she's now transformed this side hustle into a seven figures per year business without relying on Google at all. It's actually hilarious. As you'll see in the interview, I ask her, do you know what your Google traffic is? And after some hesitation, she admits she has no idea. And I had to break the news to her that her organic traffic more than tripled this year, despite doing absolutely nothing for it. You see, Lucy is a bit of a social media genius and with over 17 million total followers across all networks and 11 million on YouTube alone, she's by far the person with the most reach we've ever had in his podcast. And with Google putting so much emphasis on brand signals in the recent updates, it's no wonder her traffic is shooting up, even though honestly, I don't think her site really deserves it at this point. But her case comforts me to something I've been telling a lot of people since last year's HEU. To solve the SEO problems you're facing, you need to take your eyes off SEO for a bit and grow branded demand on some other platform so then Google picks up on these signals and rewards you with the next updates. And that's exactly what they've done with Lucy. This is one of the reasons why I have been broadening the spectrum of the guests that we are inviting on this podcast and the topics we cover in general, because I know to be successful, many of you don't need more SEO tactics. You need more of what Lucy does. And honestly, sometimes pushing this narrative feels a little bit like trying to feed vegetables to kids who want fries instead, but I'll do it anyway, at least for today. So I broke down this interview in three phases so you can easily skip around to the part that interests you the most. If you're on YouTube, there will be chapters at the bottom, so feel free to skip. The first part is all about breaking down the content creation process that she has perfected to get over 10 million subscribers in a pretty short amount of time if you look at it. The second part is the one that I think really makes her business special, and that's her lead capture strategies. She actually gets two to 3% opt-in rate from her YouTube videos. That means for this video that she posted two months ago and has 1.9 million views, she generated between 38,000 and 57,000 emails to her list. Honestly, this part is so good. It's making me rethink how we're going to approach lead magnets for our brand ourselves. And the third and final part is becoming a bit of a staple in my interviews recently, and that's her funnel roast. I go through her funnels and try to understand how she goes about transforming all the subscribers she gets from YouTube videos into actual money. And trust me, I went deep on this one. One thing I want to say is that throughout the interview, Lucy has been incredibly generous with information. And whether you're trying to learn how to use social to build an email list, or you want to learn how to monetize it, this episode really has something for you. Before we get started, I want to say thank you to Search Intelligence, who is sponsoring today's episode, the top-notch agency that can help you with digital PR, and we'll tell you more about them later. For now, let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to the Atari Hacker Podcast. Today, I am with Lucy Simkins from uh, English with Lucy. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you very much for inviting me on. I'm super excited about this one. It's like I'm I'm very excited about funnels in general. And then I spent the entire week this week essentially nerding out through your funnel. I know some people feel a bit uncomfortable when I do that, but uh, but I actually it's like I, I'm trying to be positive here. And I think what you've done is super impressive. So I'm excited to dive in and kind of learn more on like why some things are and uh, and and how you do things and and how you organize yourself behind the the scenes because this I don't see you and I'm I'm analyzing your funnel. So super excited for that. Awesome. Yeah, I hope to be celebrated and humbled in equal measures. <laughs> I mean, it, there's no humbling to be had. It's just like, it's, 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 it's cool. <laughs> but I just want to give a bit of a snapshot to the listeners slash viewers who are watching this of like how wide of a reach your business has at this point, right? You have 11.1 million subscribers on YouTube and over half a billion views. You have 1.3 million followers on Instagram. 
2 million followers on TikTok, 2.7 million followers on Facebook. I found a series on Amazon Prime with you. Is that, is that a thing? No, <laughs> like, that wasn't. That was uh, some someone downloaded all my videos and managed to sell them for a oh, while. And I cannot okay. get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found it on Google, so maybe we can talk about the MCA takedown request because Ooh. that could be useful. Yes. Um, I saw that you have over 30,000 students at this point. Yes. Yeah, we do. And uh, and you have a seven-figure-per-year uh, re revenue business, basically, uh, selling essentially English courses to non-native speakers. That's pretty impressive. How long have you been at it? Oh, I started in 2016. Um, but I okay. ran it, it was when I was at university, I ran it as a very part-time thing. Um, but I didn't, I didn't start properly selling courses until late 2021. So I ran it as an influencer style business for far longer than I should have. That was my next question is like, when did you make the first dollar? Because I feel like it looked the way it looked on the YouTube channel. It's like, yeah, it was just like making videos and that's it. And not, not having a business behind. And then recently you've gone like all in onto the business stuff and, and essentially transformed the business completely. Yeah. I mean, my first dollar, I think I remember my first sponsorship that was about, I don't know, six months in and I reached out and I asked for it and it was for $60 for an online language Ooh. tutoring platform. I must've had like 10,000 subscribers at the time. Um, and then I ran it. I mean, it, I, in my opinion, at the time, it was very successful. I had no idea what the possibilities were um, in terms of info products. Um, and so I was probably one of the top earners in the industry, but it's quite a low earning industry. If you compare, you know, the language industry with financial advice and things like that, it's quite a different market. Um, but it was yeah. when I joined forces with my husband, we started hiring a team, we went all in. Uh, that things really started to grow. Yeah, seven figures per year in the language learning industry, especially when you're competing with like apps, etc. At this point, like Duolingo, etc. It's 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 you know it's a, it's great. It's very difficult to achieve actually. So uh, I wanted to ask like, how many people do you reach monthly? Like, I guess you know you get your reach in your analytics, like uh, uh, on all your social accounts. Do you have an idea of like how many people watch a video of yours or a short or something like this? So. YouTube long form content is what we focus on most. Mm. Um, I think YouTube long and short together, we reach seven, I think probably between six to 10 million a month. Um, but it really fluctuates. You know, you have a viral video and it, it, your channel can take off for five months and then you can have a really low period. Um, we've only just started up Instagram and TikTok again. We mm. took nearly a year long break from it. Um, because we focused really heavily on um, on creating the courses and having a little bit of a rest afterwards. But now we're back on it. So I don't have those figures to hand. Um, YouTube and our email list has been our main focus for quite a while. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's how you're doing this. So I'm going to split this interview in three parts. We're first going to talk about your content creation process and how you manage to reach this many people. Then we're going to talk about capturing people into your email list since it's to be like one of your main focuses and it's the main driver for your sales. And then we're going to go quite nerdy on the funnel side of things and, and, and try to dig deep into like how you actually monetize that email list uh, in, in you know, a clean way, basically, because that's one thing that I don't like in this industry is a lot of people build email lists, et cetera, but it becomes very spammy and, and low quality. Your emails are, are pretty fun to read, actually. I quite enjoyed them. Uh, Thank so you. I want to <laughs> I want to dive into into how you put them together, basically, and and how you flow things like one after the other. Awesome. Um, I suggest we start with the content creation part, though. Um, from what I've gathered, your current content production is one long form video per week and one short form video every two days. Is that is that correct? Yes. Well done. That's spot on. Um, uh -huh. That's our like public facing content creation. And then we've got a lot of course production on. So we could probably do more social media content, um, but it's just a time and capacity thing. Um, but I think you'll have noticed that we do different endings on all of our short form as well. And we're working yep. out how to adapt properly to the different platforms because they change so fast. It's a different game now to what it was two years ago. Yeah, uh, I, you actually, it's, it's funny because like I was literally checking all your shorts for like a month or something. And I saw you took a break between June 14th and June 22nd. Like, did you, did you go on holiday or something? It was my 30th birthday. <laughs> so I rewarded myself. <laughs> um, no, we were, we had a big backlog of Facebook ads that needed editing and our shorts Ooh, editor okay. also does the Facebook ads. So 
He took a okay. time off. Okay. Uh, how do you handle this content pipeline? Like, it's pretty difficult to consistently create content, especially like after having so many videos as you have. Like, how 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 does it work? Like, from ideation all the way to publication. So we have a huge spreadsheet. I know you prefer Notion. I've tried to use tools like that, but for video long form video ideas, I just need a spreadsheet. And it's this massive one that's been going since like 2022, where every single idea I have goes into it. Um, I pull lots of videos from other channels, whether they're in my industry, my niche or not, uh, have them there, add lots of notes um, and my team of teachers are also able to access this, add things, and then we just map out week by week our one piece of long form content. Um, we normally work two and a half to three months ahead, um, mm. but it's only for the past year and a half that we've been properly working that far ahead. It felt like we were always chasing our own tails before. Um, I finally feel more or less, com I don't know if you could ever feel comfortable uh, with content planning because things change and you're always trying to hop on the latest trend. Um, but observing what other people are doing, also observing other people trying to hop on trends and failing. So then ticking that or crossing that one off your list is also an important part of it. Um, we try to put our content into three categories. It's stuff that's going to please the algorithm and get new people mm. in. Things, videos that are going to please the current subscribers and the loyal students. Uh, so they're normally higher quality, they get better leads, but we get a lower audience. Uh, but the audience seems to convert a bit better. Um, and then the last pool is stuff that I want to make because that's the best way to avoid burnout. Sometimes I was just kind of hustling for the algorithm and it, and it got a bit boring. Every now and again, I've got to throw out a silly video that I that I find funny. And normally my audience quite likes it. Nice. Uh, how do you balance that? Like what percentage of each category is, is your content strategy? Oh, I would probably say 45, 45, 10. And the 10 is for okay. me. <laughs> yeah, it's I, I get it. It's like same for us. It's like, you know, if we just talk like our audience loves talking about SEO and link building. That's basically I it's like, and but like sometimes I feel like I need to get past that. And it's like, you know, I, I don't care if nobody's watching. It's just like I, I actually do that content for me. Actually, this podcast is definitely one of them because you're definitely going deeper than than SEO. But we're going to talk about SEO a little bit later and you'll see, actually. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, we need help on that. We've we've really uh, not uh, started. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it. Don't worry. Uh, so in terms of the ideations, like where do the ideas come from for your content? Oh, I think I'm constantly on. So I consume okay. a lot of social media as well. So I easily get inspired, but I consume a lot of media of social media content that is not related to English um, and see how I can bring it in. Um, I do a lot of watching what other people in my niche are doing as well. Um, and I have a huge list and I would say probably 20% of what I put into the list um, gets binned. And then the 20% that remains probably half of that actually gets created into something someday. I just want as many ideas as possible uh, so that I can chuck away the bad ones. There's probably a treasure trove of bad ideas that have been chucked away. But yeah, it's, um, it's something I feel like I can never relax about because if I take a couple of months off without or a month off without coming up with new ideas, I feel like I've, I've fallen behind. Mm, but like, so you basically find like a cool video from even unrelated to your industry, maybe a cool format or something like this, mm -hmm. like three, you know, tongue twisters or something like this. Yeah. And, uh, like, and then you, you write it down and you just put your own twist on it. Like you bookmark it in your spreadsheet or something, and then you go through it and you're like, okay, how can I make it like yeah. an English with Lucy so, video? So I don't write the content anymore. For the, fir for the first, I don't know, five or six years I did. I used to write everything. Um, and I feel like that content was really authentic because it came, you know, it was my voice. Um, mm. But when I started hiring really great teachers who were way better explaining grammar than I was, um, I could train them to start using my voice as well. And I have a handful that specialize in producing the content for social media and I, I know their strengths. And so I allocate the different videos to them to have a look at. Sometimes I allocate to more than one teacher and, and they'll kind of collaborate together. Um, so for example, I have a teacher that is just amazing at pronunciation and teaching pronunciation in a really cool way. So if I have an idea for that, I'll allocate it to her. Um, 
I have a super creative uh, teacher who's actually now doing most of our copyright copywriting, and he does a lot of our short form content because he's so good at getting that that punchy hook. Um, and I know he consumes a lot of social media as well, so he he knows what's good. Okay. Um, so, like to recap the process, you find something, you scroll yourself, you bookmark it, you maybe add a note or something, and you pass it on to one of these teachers that then prepares a video for you inspired by it yeah then it goes on to a tele teleprompter i'll okay. normally know whilst recording it uh, if it's gonna do well or not um and sometimes we ditch a few that i just think oh, no, this isn't it doesn't have the hook point i don't get it right every every time i feel like in the past i used to get it right one in three times and one in three videos would be a hit now i feel like it's one in five the algorithm <laughs> isn't as mm. easy as it was um yeah, we have it on a teleprompter. We do batch filming. I film every two weeks. Um, I like to travel a lot. Um, so we have we just have like a pretty mobile filming kit that we can, with special colored backdrops, so we can film from a variety of places. Uh, batch filming every two weeks. And then we've got a team of editors uh, for our long form content and course co content, and then a different editor for our short form content, because um, I feel like they are very, very different. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, and I see that, especially for shorts now, it seems like it's splitting into different directions between Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Like you have the same content, but usually the last 20 seconds or something uh, are going to be unique to the platform uh, from yeah. what I've seen at least. If we have a call to action, if we're trying to get leads from a video, um, then yeah, we do stick a different end on, um, although we're considering not bothering with TikTok um, lead magnets mm. at the moment because... I'm sure we will talk about this later, but the results are not there. We're going to talk about this very soon, actually. <laughs> okay. I have one more <laughs> section before that, and that is kind of like content promotion, right? It's like, do you do anything to promote your content or you just post it and, and that's it? Like, is there, do, do you share with your list? Do you like uh, maybe share on like, I don't know, Twitter, whatever? I haven't, I haven't looked at everything, so I want to know. Um, before, it was always really encouraged to cross-promote on your platforms, but now... My understanding of the platforms as they stand is that they do not want, YouTube does not want you sending someone to Instagram and TikTok certainly doesn't want you sending someone to Facebook. So I like to keep them pretty separate. If I had all the time in the world, I would make catered content for each platform. Mm. Uh, but I need to back that up with with data and with results, um, which we don't have at the moment. Uh, or we don't have good enough results. So um uh, the only thing I do is post my YouTube video to my list, on my email list. We have a really big email list. Um, and the reason we post it to them is obviously to get that initial view hit, but also we give a free lead magnet which, with each video. And one of the benefits of being on my list and staying on my list is you just automatically get that free PDF and sometimes exercise pack each week. So it's a really high value weekly email. Um and with the bonus of it slightly increasing the YouTube uh, views. Although I'm not 100% convinced that email views to YouTube videos pay make that much of an impact. We don't notice any significant difference if we don't promote to our list. Yeah, uh, but I really like the, the, the formula though, because, you know, when you get people on your email list, the challenge is to, you know, give something a little bit exclusive to them so that there's mm. a reason to be on your email list. Otherwise, like, what's the point? Uh, why don't I just subscribe on YouTube or something? But like, because you put this lead magnet together for each video, which is what I've seen so far, you essentially give it right away to people who have already given you their email. Uh, and then that is the reason why they are still on your list because they get, they get these free exercise books basically that you've created. And then at the same time, the same resource is also growing your email list because people who watch the video and are not on your email list, they have to opt in to get it, right? Yes. And, you know, we've got hundreds and hundreds of lead magnets now because we do a unique one for every video. But mm. once you join, you only get that lead magnet you've signed up for and all future ones. So people are less likely, I think, to unsubscribe because they don't want to miss out on on all of these PDFs. Because if I do say so myself, the PDFs are amazing quality. I see people using them in schools. I, teachers write in and say they've been using them in their classrooms. And so we take a lot of pride in them. And in a way, yes, it's a great tool for getting leads, getting people down our funnel, but it's also a nice way to reward loyalty for people who do stay on the list. 
Yeah, I agree. I think they're really good. Actually, it's funny because I was going through the funnel. I started like doing the exercises myself, and I was like, <laughs> I don't have time right now. <laughs> so it's like uh, I did the uh, the interactive ones, but yeah, I actually did that like just to to test myself, and oh, I didn't cool. want to know the results, so I didn't finish. <laughs> but. <laughs> But um, I, I really want to talk more about the lead magnets, but I really want to finish on the video creation mm. first. So um, that you're, you're pretty, like, given the reach that you have on social, like, you're doing very well with videos. Like, how do, like, retention is basically the number one metric for, for reach now at this point. Like, if people watch your videos long enough, you'll get enough distribution. Can you give me, like, three tips as a beginner to improve my retention on my social or on my long form videos? Yeah, I'll start with a really simple one that I did um, re uh, in the last couple of years. If you have, I used to have this beautiful 10 to 15 second, or maybe it was five seconds. It felt like ages each time I watched it. Intro with like music and it was like a slow motion video of London. No one cares. People were just skipping through it. It was affecting reach. It also meant that when people were skipping through their feed and they saw the, sometimes you see like a GIF version of your video gif mm. or gif that could be a video i'll write that down video, yeah. um but yeah you can see the the moving version of the vi youtube video when you go past mine all you'd see was this intro <laughs> uh, whereas if you go on another video you'd see the beginning and it would hook you in um so remove that i know it makes you feel all professional to have your logo appear and music play but i don't i don't see the value in it um other ways to improve retention mm, this is such a good question i would say if you have an editing team make sure they have access uh, to the analytics so that they can deep dive in as well and see these things that uh, create hooks um, at first i was quite protective of my social media i was so worried about you know oversharing with the team but now i think it's really important that they they can look in there and like analyze their work and see themselves the hook points and the the retention peaks I think I need to get to grips with it more, actually. Um, I, for the first kind of five years of, of running the YouTube channel, I was winging it a little bit. Um, and I do think there is still nothing more important than a really good thumbnail. And that's something that we need to be working on for the next year because I still make a lot of the thumbnails. I've tried out different thumbnail creators. Um, I've never really fallen in love with any of them. So... That's the thing I'm I'm really looking for. So watch this space. <laughs> Have you tried them though? Because I feel like what you said, like uh, you, you know, when you hired the teachers to prepare the scripts, you were like, oh, I loved my my tone, and then eventually I realized people were like, you know, better than me. Do you think something similar is happening with thumbnails? I don't think I've given enough time and energy uh, to training mm. up a thumbnail designer uh, because it's something I've been so precious over. Um, but that's silly because it took me a while to find an editor I really liked. Um, and then once we had that relationship built and we got through that onboarding phase, it was a no brainer. And I can't believe I didn't do it sooner. So I think that's something that could even be holding my channel back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, fair enough. Uh, I think it's the same for us. Like, you know, I, I tend to like be a bit technical, so I'm, I'm not afraid to like go and do everything. Mm. The problem is I hold a lot of things back when I just don't pass them on. And it's like I just have so many hours where I can focus intensely in the day and so it's like it's it's been a big job from Mark to like force me to like give stuff up in the business because uh, you always feel like you do things better yourself but eventually it holds you back down um, in terms of like actually talking about the team do you post your own videos or do you have someone managing all of that and all the scheduling and is there some strategy behind this so we have um, our operations manager and she uh, does the uploading of all the YouTube videos and preparation. But because I'm still in charge of the thumbnails, the huge thumbnail mm. issue, this is a huge issue. And I think I'm going to address this as soon as I finish this <laughs> podcast call because I'm seeing the light now. Um, but I, the last thing I'll do before I post the video is make the thumbnail and kind of come up with ideas for it. So I'm the one who schedules it or posts it immediately. Mm. Um, it's definitely something I could do better. Same with TikTok and Instagram and Facebook Reels. At the moment, um, I get a big batch and I just upload them and come up with the captions. Once I start to feel a little bit more comfortable with what works and what doesn't work, then I'm more than happy to hand that off. In fact, I can't wait. Fair enough. Um, I want to talk about platforms now. So it's like, let's do a little bit of a tier list, right? So you're very present on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, right? It's kind of like the four platforms where I can find you. 
Let's go from the worst platform for your business to the best platform for your business in terms of like, I guess, sales and, uh, and, and what works best for you. Because I'm, I'm not sure like view numbers are always correlated with sales and, and with actually business growth. And I want to hear it from you because you're, you're, you're big on all these platforms. So you have like a vision that very few people have, I'd say. So which one do you say is the worst platform and why? Okay, I'm going to divide this into YouTube, YouTube Shorts and keep them separate. Fair. Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. And I would say the bottom for me at the moment actually could be YouTube shorts. The reason why, and it's it's fighting with TikTok, but the reason why is I don't know what it does for my channel apart from overinflate my numbers, bring in like next to no ad revenue. Not that ad revenue is a big part of our business anymore, but it's almost insulting when you get 30 million views on a video and then they pay you $40 or something. Um, but the problem with YouTube shorts is they used to allow a pinned comment where you could have a, a link. And so mm. I used to at least be able to get a few leads from YouTube shorts, um, and say, you know, click the link in the pinned comment. Then they took that away. And now I have a load of really high performing YouTube shorts that have a fake lead magnet in it because people can't get it. There is no way. Um, so super annoying. Um, and also quite a few went you know, majorly viral, got millions and millions of views, brought in loads and loads of subscribers, but these subscribers don't seem to interact with my short form, with my long form content, nor do they seem to, when they subscribe, it's not like my shorts all then appear in their subscription feed. I Maybe it just makes them slightly more likely to see my shorts again in their feed. I, I'm not really sure how it works. I'm not sure YouTube is that sure how it works either. Um, so yeah, that's the one I'm most, you know, frustrated with because I feel uneasy about it because I don't know if it's negatively or positively affecting the channel, I see, which is so valuable to us. Next is TikTok, um, because you can get so many views on there and it just, I don't think it's my, you know, ideal audience from a sales point of view. Um, anytime you have any sort of call to action or you mention link in bio or anything, the video gets suppressed. Um, Oof. so normally we get, you know, a couple of hundred thousand, maybe a million views on a TikTok. If I say, ah, oh, there's an ebook, click on the link in the bio, I'll get like 18,000 or something. Um, and the, the leads we do get, they just don't convert. I just exported all of our latest leads. And I think we had like four sales. Um, from TikTok and they'd gone, you know, it was like a couple of thousands of them all going down a welcome sequence. Um, after that, Facebook Reels, we don't really do any long form uh, content on Facebook. Probably should. Um, but we just don't, we, we see a very different audience that's much less willing to buy. Um, and then YouTube. Oh, no, Instagram. I have to say Instagram mm. next. You can get good leads with many chat. I wonder... So that's when, you know, the automatic chatbot where you say, you know, write book and I'll send you my book and then they get an automatic message. That brings in a lot of leads. Um, we're still gathering data on whether they convert, but they seem to be converting in a way that's better than nothing. Um, and then YouTube is the number one, but not for sales. If we launch a course and we make a promo video and we post it on YouTube, we don't get that many sales because our lead magnet game is so strong on YouTube that the people who are going to buy are already on our email list. Um, I see. Yeah, so we don't see many direct sales from YouTube. Because people have probably engaged with your content multiple times before they buy, so they've already downloaded like four lead magnets and then they buy, I guess. Yes, yeah. And um, we do a lot of promotions, probably more than your listeners would expect on our email list. And we okay. think that we are... You know, we're not too spammy because we give a lot of, of value. Okay, that's super interesting. It's super interesting because, you know, TikTok's super hot, for example, and everyone's talking about that. Um, I, I, YouTube short for me, it's like it's a, it's a separate platform from YouTube. I feel like they just kind of like they run two platforms and then they just have a common subscriber account. Um, but it's it, it was, I saw your shorts and I saw you basically have a link to a lead magnet, but it's not a link, so people need to copy it. So I went on my phone and I tried to copy the link, but I can't copy the link because <laughs> they don't give you the option to copy it. The, the, yeah. It's horrible. They've made uh, it really hard. Um, we ha we've come up with lots of ideas. You could try a QR code, although people are often already watching on their phones. So how the would phone, they do yeah. the QR? And then also you could, we bought a really short domain um, and we 
you know, you could have a very, yeah. very short domain, but you know, the harder you fight it, that they're just going to find more ways and you're creating pieces of content that are only, you hope will go viral for years, maybe. Um, but then they change their system so it doesn't work anymore. So I don't, I don't know what they're aiming for with, with YouTube shorts, really. Let's see. It's like, I, I guess it's bound to change and it's good to grow there for now. And yeah. then potentially later you get something. Maybe. Uh, there's one channel we didn't talk about and that is SEO. Ah, um, yes. <laughs> uh, have you looked at your Google traffic recently? Um, yes, we... <laughs> Why is my question. <laughs> Not why look <laughs> so, at SEO. So you haven't, no. so you haven't looked. <laughs> um, my husband, he he's the one who looks at SEO, but very, very lightly. And we've we've been doing backlinks and things like that. But I feel very embarrassed um, saying anything in such SEO company. Okay. I'm interested to know why you're asking. <laughs> I'm asking because your traffic's been shooting up recently with recent updates. Ah, uh, is that? Ah, okay. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, that well, thing. Of course, I have seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has. It has been shooting up a lot, and and one of the possible explanations is that Google has been doing a lot of changes in its algorithm in the last few months. Like they really, they're basically trying to walk a little bit more like a social network where where you can show engagement on your content. They will essentially show your site more. And because you have a large social media presence, a lot of people you know search for your brand, etc and land on your site, and it seems to be helping because your site curve is like, it's literally shooting up right now. Uh, even though I admit when I checked the articles, I was a little bit underwhelmed. Uh, I think you can do better like embedding your videos and and, and in terms of lead magnets, pop-ups, etc. I don't want to go through like, you know, there's a lot of things to do, but I, it seems like now is a really good time to look at it um, because, because Google is rewarding the kind of create a profile that you're matching with. So it's like, if you had more content and most importantly, if you collected more leads through pop-ups, et cetera, I think you could make SEO uh, quite worth it for your business, actually. Okay, I'm convinced. Will and I, we were just talking about this the other day. Um, we've just been doing the bare minimum to feel like mm -hmm. we're doing something with SEO, um, but we know we have the capacity and we're coming down now to the end of a really high, high, like, productivity period where our whole team was overloaded but we also didn't feel like we wanted to take on more team members so we kind of felt capped um but now I think it would be really interesting to work on SEO because yes you're right the articles are underwhelming and there are so many quick fixes and large fixes we could probably implement yeah especially on lead generation like uh, mm. you just have a sidebar uh like your, your lead magnet game is so strong on your videos and then i came to the blog and i was like <laughs> what is it so if you actually put like a pop-up that like loads on page load or things like that you can collect like i collect two to three percent of opt-ins on uh, on, oh, wow. uh so if, if i get a hundred visitors i get three leads basically if i get a hundred thousand you know i get two three thousand leads um so it's uh it's it's pretty good when you optimize for it and Google loves your your brand right now, uh, so there's thank there's you. something to. Uh, I didn't do anything for that, so <laughs> you'll have to thank me. <laughs> um, that's but, really uh, interesting. Yeah, we're we're currently undergoing a website redesign as well. Um, nice. So hopefully we can do that thoughtfully and and make it as good as possible until it all changes okay. again. Yeah, I I think it's a huge opportunity. Okay. And now for a quick word from this episode's sponsor, Search Intelligence. Do you remember this campaign? It was all over the news. It is the most intelligent royal campaign. With over 100 links generated in the world's biggest online publications, this is one of the most viral PR campaigns of 2021. This is how we've done it. The methodology was pretty simple. We looked at the QS World University rankings for the institutions attended by key members of the royal family to discover which royal is the brightest of all. Meghan Markle came out on top, followed by Kate Middleton and Prince William. We put these findings in a press release and sent it to mainstream media and journalists who write about royals. From Russia to the UK, the US, Vietnam and Japan, this story got massive coverage, landing over 100 links and created a massive buzz on social media. Simple research, but a great story that journalists love to write about. I hope this will put you on fire and will give you inspiration.
Thanks again to the sponsor of this episode, Search Intelligence. If you're looking to boost your link building with high quality digital PR campaigns, head over to search-intelligence.co.uk. And now back to the episode. I, I wanted to ask also, like, do you ever sell, you sell directly in your content sometimes, right? Like you literally promote your courses, et cetera, in your videos. How do you do CTAs without killing your reach? Because that's a huge taboo on social media these days. Um, is this on YouTube or on Instagram? Yeah. On, so on we experimented a lot. And our idea at the time was, because we don't do it as much anymore, um, our idea at the time was we have a lot of what we call hero videos. These are videos that consistently get 20K views a day for yeah. three years. Wouldn't it be amazing if we had a great evergreen offer for one of our low-cost courses in there? Um, so we did that and it did okay, but the results were really underwhelming. And I think that is because... A, when you're putting the CTA in, or you don't know if that's going to be a hero video or not. And I'm finding it harder to predict each time if it's going to be a hero video. And then also you are pulling people away. So, and you, YouTube don't want that. So we've stopped doing it. When we have a big launch um, of like a brand new course or a really exciting sale, maybe sometimes Black Friday or, you know, a new course, um, then we will do a dedicated video but then we'll we'll remove it afterwards. Um, so it's just like a, it's just there for a week. I see. Um, the thing that does work are live stream webinar style videos. When we have a launch, we will do, we will actually launch the, the new course in a live stream instead of an email and the results seem to be stronger. And normally mm. we will do a closing down sale as well when we're ending it we'll have the countdown and we'll pull everyone's names up on screen and really as people are buying they get shouts out shout outs and it's really interactive okay. and and it, people people get really excited so you have a life when you open the course and when you close it yes yeah when we close okay. the, the enrollment okay yeah that's super interesting uh, I, I i agree like lives are like a little bit of a different kind on youtube and they get a little bit of a different reach and uh yeah i can see how that would work actually i think Russell Branson does a lot of live, for example, as well. So uh, it's something that uh, that probably work. Okay, let's talk about uh, capturing leads and, and your email marketing. We can talk about the lead magnets. We can talk about all of that. Uh, I think that is going super, to be super interesting. That's my favorite part of your business, to be honest. I feel like that's the kind of like the thing that you're, you're most you know, unique for is, is your ability to, to drive your viewers into uh, opt-ins. And one thing that I was very surprised at is when I looked at your long form videos, the CTA to the lead magnet is literally just after the intro most of the time, right? It's like there's the intro is like, oh, hey, download this exercise book. So you reach more people that way. But in my head, I was like, isn't your reach going to die because of that? Or, or like, is that not an issue? Yeah, I thought the same thing at first as well. And we experimented, but it was from my experience. We don't do sponsorships anymore. But when I did... Mm like the difference in results uh, for the sponsors was so stark when we had a lead, when we had the shout out in the first 60 seconds compared to the first 180 seconds compared to at the end. So I just knew that was the only option. And we still had loads of videos go viral that contain sponsor sponsors. And we still have videos that go viral with all our lead magnets in. Um, I think it gets to the point now where people who aren't interested will just click ahead and you do see that little peak. Yeah, so for every 100 views, we tend to get one to two, sometimes even three, depending on how juicy the lead magnet is. Uh, sign, sign up to my email list, um, or our email list. And I mean, it would be, it's just a no brainer for us because ad revenue for us is low with our industry. We, we get a very, very diverse um, nationalities watching, different ad rates in each country. Uh, we wouldn't even, I don't even think we'd be able to pay our editing team um, and writers yeah. on just ad revenue. So the, the lead magnets is what we do. Fair enough. Uh, it, my, the thing is like, what I'm thinking hearing you is that it's probably worth front loading your CTA provided it's high value so that people actually like are excited for it and keep watching and keep doing, doing that. But you might be willing to trade less reach for more opt-ins and that probably still helps your business furthermore than getting as much reach as possible, given, especially given the low uh, ad rates, basically. Would you agree with that? That is a perfect summary, I think. Um, yeah, I think it helps that the lead magnet perfectly complements the video. 
uh, because mm. I don't think I don't know if I've mentioned what the lead magnets are yet, but they are lesson notes for the video. So they're gorgeous PDFs, um, really really beautiful, and they have like a nice lesson summary of all the content plus more plus more information and always a quiz at the end and sometimes an interactive, a link to an interactive exercise pack. So they are designed for people to use after they've watched the video to test what they've learned, to see if they've taken it in. Yeah, there's a risk that people might just download that and not watch the video. Um, we'd have to do some A-B testing, I think, to work it out for sure. Uh, does it even matter if they use the lead magnet? It's like in the end, they're still deeper in your funnel, right? It's mm. like... It, they consume your their, your content on their time. Uh, one thing I really liked is you had the answers like in reverse at the end of the page, and I really like that. It just like reminded me of my childhood days when I was doing these things in the, during the holidays, you know, these little exercises from school. Uh, I really like that. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, how much work does goes into a lead magnet, and and like, do you have a template system? Like, how how does it work? Because I think this is one of the keys of your business. You have hundreds of lead magnets like this, uh, and it's like. It's probably like a large part of the creation of a video, right? Yeah, um, it's definitely a couple of hours per lead magnet. Um, in fact, our operations manager is currently doing an audit because I think we're spending slightly too much time on PDFs in general. So we have our courses are so PDF and interactive activity heavy um, and they are taking more time than they should at the moment. We're seeing how we can streamline it. Um, I think the PDFs are created on google slides if i or maybe they're on canva actually uh okay. it depends um and they do take quite a while but i have nothing to do with them to be quite honest um our operations manager is the most organized person i've ever met in my life and she has everyone on this like automated system where they tick that they're done and it gets sent to the next one um i'm sure we can make it even better though I mean, I think it's pretty good already. Um, so you're promoting it on screen. You're telling people they can download it. There is a QR code. I guess it's for people who watch on YouTube TV, basically. They're just watching and snapping it. Uh, and do you use anything else? Do you use like, like you have it in the description. Do you use pin comments? Do you use annotation on screen? Like how, how do you link to your lead magnet in a long form video? So the QR thing is new and actually seems to be doing quite well. Uh, one of the mm. recent lead magnets, I think it got 20,000 downloads and 1,000 of them came from the QR codes. I was really surprised by that. I didn't believe in QR codes when I first saw them. I thought they were just okay. weird and not going to go anywhere. And then obviously COVID happened and everyone got, <laughs> every menu is under a QR code. So I think that really helped people become used to them. Um, we also, yes, we use a pinned comment. Uh, I'm sorry that I haven't done any testing to see how many come from the pin comment, how many come from the description, but that would be cool to see if it's worth it. Sometimes you've just got to think, oh, I'll just do it. It takes two seconds. Um, we also bought, as I said, a really short domain. It's like ewl.info. Um, and we have a very simple like PDF one, PDF two at the end of it. Um, and people, we put that on screen just in case you know, someone's on their phone, but they want to, they've also got their, their iPad with them and they want to type it in fairly easily. Um, and that's it. Yeah. I mean, one to 2% opt-in is very good. It's comparable to a blog, basically comparable to what mm -hmm. I told you about SEO, basically. Like I think like 2%, it's like, you're pretty happy already with your opt-in rate. So, uh, so I would say it's like, you know, a lot of people, the, uh, you know, like we're on the side where a lot of people now got bashed by Google updates and they're like, they have to play with the other platforms, including YouTube, et cetera, but they feel like they lose control compared to having a website. And what I'm hearing from you, the, this person, this opt-in rate is, is so good that I'm like, there's not even a point bothering uh, fighting Google on, on your own site when you can actually just get the same opt-in rate on, on YouTube, actually. So it's quite interesting to hear how you do that. Do you put anything on the end screen as well? Because obviously that's another area where you can optimize. Do you know what? We've never noticed that much engagement from our end screens. Um, okay. But that's a good idea. So yes, potentially we should. Um, we just, ah, just before our end screen, I say, and don't remember, I say, don't remember. I say, don't forget to download the PDF, the links in the description, <laughs> and we show everything again. Um, maybe we should hold it for longer, especially the QR code and the link on the end, end screen. Uh, yeah. And I think the whole, the thing with lead magnets is to 
not put all of your eggs in one basket because we know we're at the mercy of these huge companies that seem to be very temperamental and change. Mm -hmm. I mean, YouTube could one day say, oh, no, no more links in the description or Mm -hmm. no more links that lead off platform. And then I'd be in trouble. But that's why I'm trying to build a presence on other platforms as well. And clearly on my SEO. (laughs) Uh, I mean, you have an opportunity right now. Yeah. I think uh, think you should seize it, you know. (laughs) Yeah, we can have a chat. I'm seeing you in a in a week or something. I'll tell you that yeah, yeah. I've put something sure. in place. <laughs> we'll, we'll chat about this. Uh, you bragged about having a big email list. How big is it? Um, do you know what? We are high, high, high six figures. I We always clean it before we get to seven. Um, I, I love that because that's my next question. Like, how do you <laughs> maintain it, actually? <laughs> we clean frequently and hard. And I think I hear very different opinions on how you should manage cleansing the email list. Um, we use ConvertKit. Uh, mm-hmm. We really, really like it. Um, they have the engagement star rating. So basically anyone who has never purchased, who hasn't engaged within a certain amount of time. It depends on how recently they join the list. Um, Every two months, we um, will send them a very basic re-engagement email, but we don't really bother with the re-engagement campaigns. Thing is, if people- It doesn't work that well for me. No, I don't think so either. And, you know, sometimes they're six-figure cleansers. Um, I always download them all and set store them just in case I ever made a mistake, but we've never revisited um, people that have left. Um, so yeah, the, the email list grows really fast, but we also are not afraid to hack off quite a few people. Yeah, that's good. I, get, I think that helps a lot. Uh, especially when you collect this many emails, there must be a lot of like junk emails or people who don't oh, open, yeah. people who mistype the emails, etc. Because for what I've seen, you use single opt-in, right? Uh, yes, we experimented with both. Um, we were advised to use single opt-in. Um, because it apparently it drastically increased the signups. And so we're willing mm-hmm. to just clean up the list more often. Um, but yeah, I'd be yeah. I'd be interested to test it again because that was something you put in place two and a half years ago. I mean, yeah, I mean, we haven't tested recently, but yeah, it's like we, we saw like 30% uplift or something mm. from going from double opt-in to single opt-in. Obviously, you know, 30% more emails, but maybe like 12% of these are, are probably not emails you, you want or they're fake emails or something. So... It's like it, it's hard to exactly gauge like the exact gain of of good subscribers, but there's definitely some in there. So it's like you you'll make more money, but you need to be more responsible with how you manage your email list. Yeah, we're trying to we're now taking even more care than ever on how we send our emails, trying to really keep our delivery rates up. So maybe that is something we'll look into quite soon. Because for example, we to anyone who is not a five star engaged subscriber. Um, I don't know the exact criteria for that. It's calculated by a convert kit um, or someone who's purchased. If they're basically our value emails go to nearly the whole list, but any promos or anything that only goes to super engaged people. Okay, interesting. Mm. And, and you gauge engagement based on opens and clicks? Is that is that basically how it works? Or? Um, as far as I'm aware, the convert kit engagement mm. rating it goes off that yeah so not perfect but yeah not perfect because now apple mail automatically mm. opens every single email uh and clicks on the links as well so so it's a Joy. way to like uh yeah. lose the trackers so like we use active campaign and they basically have two uh levels for open rates you have like the one for like apple devices and the one for uh everything else because otherwise it's it it doesn't work it actually makes your open rate much higher than it actually is because people did not open the email. So it's, it's quite tricky to to manage your list because of these privacy features, I find. And there was me thinking we were just doing such a great job that our open rates were going up. <laughs> I mean, it's probably it's probably Maybe. working, but <laughs> it's probably working, but there's a there's a part of that where <laughs> Apple has these privacy things where yeah. they literally just auto open everything and auto click everything. So like some emails are send an email and I see like I see a thousand clicks in like two minutes or something, for example. Mm. Uh, but that's just the Apple uh, system that clicked on the links, not necessarily people who clicked or something like. Uh, so it's just something to keep in mind. But I'm sure ConvertKit has thought about it. And yeah, I'll have a look. I'm sure it's on their radar. Um, so I'll have a look at that. 
Uh, I want to talk about short form video lead, lead generation because I think um, I think like we said YouTube shorts is terrible basically. Mm. Um, how is TikTok? Like how do you, how how does that work on TikTok? So for TikTok, we the only way we found is a link in bio because we sell digital yeah. products. I think if you're selling a real product, <laughs> real a physical product, um, <laughs> then yeah, you can have amazing success on TikTok. Um, in fact, TikTok reached out to me and they were like oh, we need to, you know, get you on TikTok shop and get you selling in lives mm. and all of that. And then they were like, remind me again what you sell. I said, online courses. And they were like, oh, no, 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 no. We can't. You That's can't so sell funny. those. Um, no, you, you can sell like scammy uh, Chinese products or whatever, but no, uh, well, no online courses. I think they wanted, they invited me to be a part of something where you could sell batches of videos but there was no interactivity and you know we take a lot of pride in our courses i'm not going to sell a batch of standalone videos with no quizzes or pdfs or anything with them um yeah they, they make it hard they don't want anyone to leave the platform we do get leads from tiktok but such few sales um even when we launch a brand new course that we think is perfect for the tiktok market that it just doesn't convert. So we're kind of using it as a just in case. I've already made the shorts or the, the short form yeah, content. Just them there, so we might as well. Yeah. Do you have an idea of the opt-in rate on, on there or not really? I actually, shall I give you like what our total, I think we got something like 20,000 leads and I think we sold like eight courses or something. It oh, was yeah, like that's not absolutely minuscule. Um, but the funny thing is TikTok's quite good for your ego if you want to be recognized in public, which I actually... I don't get recognized a lot in public, um, but if I do, it's often someone who is British or American, not my ideal audience, who have seen my my videos, which is funny. So I think a problem with TikTok is that they they push it. If you are making a if you make an English speaking TikTok video, they will push it to an English speaking audience. Mm. Um I think it has yeah. something to do with where you post the video or the SIM card in your phone or something. Yeah, I guess you need someone to post from uh, another country and then maybe that's going to help. Then I'd have to uh, choose which one. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. Instagram, though, is working quite well for you, right? Yeah, Instagram always surprises us. Um, we've launched a couple of courses and done promos on, uh, you know, organic promos on Instagram and they've done considerably better than we thought. Sometimes they surpassed direct sales on YouTube, but then, of course, we have more leads from YouTube on our email list. So you can't really compare. Um, but yeah, now with many chat, we are getting a really surprising number of leads um, to the point where an Instagram video that goes, you know, moderately viral, like a, maybe a million views, will bring in more leads than a YouTube video with 200,000 mm. views, which I didn't expect. I'm not I'm not 100% sure whether they're converting well. I don't think it compares that well when they go down the Instagram when they go down the welcome sequence, but I think we might have uh priced our product too high or done something too high priced for Instagram yeah, on that. Oh, that was my next question actually like are short form content subscribers less lower value than long form content subscribers basically. Yes, I think they're younger. Um, mm. especially on TikTok, so they don't have as much disposable income. Um, I'm just drawing my own conclusions here, but they're probably a little bit more, you know, they've got a shorter attention span. I would like to think they'd okay. be more impulsive, <laughs> but they, you know, you're swiping through. I see it with myself as well. Um, I get like half dopamine hits where I'm like, oh, I might buy that. Actually, no, I'm on to the next thing. Um, you definitely have people's attention more with written content and long form. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, even though you have less reach, it might still be more valuable for your business. Yes. Uh, I think it's like Alex Holmosi as well, who is like, you know, he gets so much reach on, on shorts, but he was like, actually, like, it's not helping my business at all. So I'm just refocusing mostly on, on long form content because mm. of that actually. Um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say that uh, with our content planning, we've now put in a, a lot more really long videos that we know we're not going to do as well. And they go, they're like deep, deep dives into grammar or really advanced English because the advanced English speakers do tend to buy a little bit more. I think maybe because there are fewer advanced English courses on the market. Um, our C1 course was our best-selling course ever, which is the advanced level. Um, 
so yeah, we put something out and it's almost quite peaceful posting one of those really long videos. It's like, I know I'm not, I know this isn't going to go viral, but I know no it's going to bring in really good leads. Um, and so, yeah, that's part of our strategy. Okay. Uh, one thing I saw as well is on your Facebook ads library, I saw that you are actually sending people to opt-in pages through your ads as well. Um, can you tell me like who is targeted by these ads? Are you just like cold targeting or are you just retargeting people who watch your content or, or how does that work? Um, so this was an ad that we ran last year, I think. I don't think we do it at the moment um, because mm. we don't have uh, a tripwire product in place at the moment. We are creating one. We had one back then um, and we got, uh, they were okay results. The tripwire product wasn't, it wasn't good enough. Um, mm. And then after they bought the tripwire, they didn't go right down any other funnel. We just did, we were building courses and we were so distracted that we, we half-assed that one. Quite honestly, I don't know too much about that. I think they went, they, there was a level test where people would get their level test, but we found that that was quite an impulsive thing. Um, and there's a big difference in the people that would just go down a quiz and get, just want their result or people that want to engage with a beautiful ebook that you've made and, you know, you can talk about your courses all the way through it. Um, and also with a level test, people tend to really disagree with the results um, and yeah. actually get quite angry about it. We've got some really angry emails where people are just, they didn't want to be told that they were a lower level than they thought they were. Um, so yes, it was, it was an unsuccessful experiment, but we're going to try again this year when our tripwire courses are made. Whenever we make our courses, we work with a curriculum designer and we've done, we've worked with a curriculum designer to make some really beautiful tripwire courses. I'm aiming for a slightly lower opt-in rate because it's not a super spammy promise, like learn English in five days. It's actually a, mm. a, something genuine they will be able to achieve. Um, so slightly lower opt-in, but hopefully a much higher opt-in to the upsell, which will be to go to one of our full English level courses. I'll what let price you... point are you going for in your trip wires? We don't know. It, previously, we did $17 and $27. And the $17, we A-B tested it and the $17 won. Um, so we went lower. Um, I don't know. For some okay. reason, the number seven always seemed to work. So we'll probably do seven, seventeen, twenty-seven. See what works. <laughs> Just try everything uh, and see what works best. I want to talk about your evergreen funnel. So I opted yeah. into one of your lead magnets uh, one week ago. So you know, I watched the video, I clicked on the link, I opted in. I found myself doing the exercises. Then I, I was like, <laughs> "What am I doing? I don't have time right now." Uh, but it was fun. Um, but um, the first thing that I noticed is your thank you page, which was like just like thank you, your email is coming soon. And it's like, that's it. And I was like, ah, oh, there's, there's maybe a missed opportunity here of at least tell people to follow you on social or something. Like you can do soft soft CTAs, but I feel like your thank you, your thank you page, people just, just gave you their personal contact details. It's like, there's an opportunity to, to do more actually. So it's like, just like one little piece of feedback here that I think there's, there's an opportunity to, for something on this page. Um, awesome. Yeah. So that's an interesting thing so we had the tripwire on the thank you page of course yeah, yeah and then obviously we took it away so we just replaced it with a message um we could definitely do more with it but why would you want to um distract people when they're straight on the way to their inbox their email inbox ready to engage with your first email and the actual piece of content you've sent them uh, usually the the reason is like the less steps there are the in between like opting in and buying the more people convert like it's like you right. know it's like it, it's like the less friction you put so like usually what we do for example like we have this like free training thing so people opt in and the thank you page is like the lead magnet actually so it's like you get there and it's like here you go you know since we do single opt-in uh it doesn't matter like we'll, we'll we'll cleanse them out of the list later if they don't engage on do, do anything um so like here you go no friction here's what you wanted let me deliver value to you right away and then below the video because we do it as a video then there's a button to go to that essentially launches the evergreen funnel for people. So mm. it's like the the thank you page becomes what they opted in for. So it's like, it's really nice. And at the same time, like, it's kind of like you can fast forward through the funnel the same way you would watch a Netflix TV show and just like uh, not want to wait for next week to see the, the next episode, you know? Um, so it's like, yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of the logic, obviously, like, 
we I don't think we have tested this in a while. So it's like, but in terms of experience, like we feel like if people can just fast forward through the the thing with as little friction as possible, for us we just get more cells actually. Okay. Yeah, that's a great test idea. I'm um so I'm gonna have to listen yeah. to all of this again to to retake okay. my notes. <laughs> well, th- at least we get one view on the podcast. That's yes. Nice. <laughs> but um. Uh, so then the first email came in and asked me for my level of English, right? It's like, it was mm. like, oh, like, are you like uh, A1, B1, something like this? And, uh, you know, you, ex- you had an explanation for each one, like, oh, you can watch the videos, but with subtitles, you can watch the videos without subtitles, which was really nice. But um, what what's the logic behind that? Why, why do you do that? Oh, because we have three different courses, um, our B1, B2, and C1. Um, B1 is intermediate B2, upper intermediate, C1 advanced. Um, mm-hmm. And so we want to gauge which level they think they are at so that we can promote, that we can send them down the right welcome sequence. So the four links actually have the same PDF behind them. It's just whichever link they click on, they then get a different tag and then they'll be sent down the right welcome sequence. Um, the welcome sequences should be re- written you know, they should be quite different. They're not that different at the moment. They just have, you know, the different course at the end of them. Um, but it's something that we're working on. But that's the logic behind that. Okay. What happens if I don't click? Um, we have a little delay. I think it's two days. And then we automatically assign our middle level course, which is B2, which was our most popular at the time of creating the welcome sequence. Oh. Okay. Yeah, because I've done that before, right? I've created sequences where people have multiple choices, and I completely forgot the op- the, the, the the scenario where people don't <laughs> click on anything. <laughs> <laughs> it just wouldn't trigger. Oh no! So it's, like, so it's like, yeah, it happens. Like you know, it's like I can roast people, but I think you could roast me back right there. You know, it's like. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's good that you thought about it. So basically, after that, I got two days of storytelling. Right? It's like the story of like the student who cried in the. In a classroom. But don't and ruin then... it for everyone. It's a very exciting all right, all right. story. <laughs> then there's a there's a plot twist on the email after, so I won't tell I won't tell what happened. Uh, it felt inspired by like uh, Andrew Chaperon, like uh, these um, soap opera sequences. He called it that. Like it basically you tease what comes in the next email. And you have a bit of storytelling. You yeah. introduce yourself, etc. Uh, is that is that where it comes from? Um, I think so. Uh, was it called a super? What did you say it was called? Soap opera sequence. So proper sequence. Yes, exactly. It, um, I okay. think so we worked with a very good friend of ours who has, you know, done lots of these and he introduced us to that concept and helped us build it and write okay. it. It was something where I had put it off for so long. I really don't enjoy copywriting at all. Um, mm. But at that time I had not, I eventually put one of my teachers through copy school and he's become awesome at writing copy. Um, but at that time, I just, it was one, it was a huge block for me and I wasn't getting it done. So we worked with someone, he helped us get it done. We know it could be a lot better, um, but we really liked the story type of it. And it gets loads of engagements from our students. And, you okay. know, a lot of our videos on YouTube, we teach through stories and our courses teach through stories as well. So we thought it made sense that the emails do as well. Okay. I'm, I'm just surprised to hear an English teacher doesn't like copywriting, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's yeah. cool. <laughs> uh. So after the two emails, I got basically a product intro email. So like an email that breaks down what's in the course. I was in the C1 sequence. Mm-hmm. Um, then I got basically a testimonial email. So an email that would like show some stories of people who got value from the course. Then I got an FAQ email. So basically it like asks which questions you like, you may have with some answers. And then I got two close emails. It's mm-hmm. pretty much uh, how, how the launch went for me. Uh, but again, like one thing that I was surprised is that you wait two days before you put a clear call to action to the course, actually. So it's almost like three days after the, the lead magnet, basically. So like, it's interesting to me because from our experience, like, you know, when, when I'm opting in for a lead magnet, like to, to improve my English, my emotional state is at a point where it might be very different three days from now. So mm. it's, it's, it's a long time, three days. And I felt like maybe you could blend the, cop- the, the storytelling with with the selling a bit earlier because it's opened anyway. There's a link to buy really at the bottom of the email, but I guess there's not a lot of clicks on this. On the PS? (laughs) Um, No, I think you're right. I think for me writing it, I didn't want someone to, I think I got too emotional about it. I was like, they're my babies, my students. I don't want to promise them a free PDF and then be like, buy my, but 
now I'm considering putting a tripwire in. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. maybe I need to get Just... over myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't want to be too pushy. That was what the idea okay. was. Um, but I definitely didn't understand that the customer psychology there of I'm ready. I want to buy now. Um, I think it would be an easy test to do. Yeah, I Should think do it. a big opportunity here. Actually. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no worries. Uh, and so the course was $75 off. So it was like $224 instead of $299 for the lower tier and $374 instead of $449 for the higher tier, which has some coaching uh, baked in basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're basically offering a set. For me, by the way, the sales page didn't close, by the way. That's one thing. It's like uh, after the launch, I can still access the sales page. Is that is that Do you close your, your launches or is that just the links? Stay that let's stay like that. Um it should close. I'll have to review that. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay, maybe it wasn't long enough then. Um uh, yeah. Could be it. When it hits, um it then just should redirect to our course catalogue. So did you get to zeros to the So when I click on the link, the, the countdown doesn't show at all. And I still open the link actually. Okay. I think something has gone wrong with a webhook. We did get an email Happens. about it the other day. Um we use deadline funnel and I think something changed. We use it too. Okay. Okay, we we use deadline funnel too. It's uh, but like yeah, it's like I was surprised I could still open it. But like I was I was wondering because basically you offer seventy five dollars off, right? Mm. Um, and then you have your full price course. Like, do you sell a lot of full price courses? Yes, we do. Um, okay. I wish I could give you numbers, but it's recently gone up a lot. We've um, especially when we run any sort of Facebook ad, it just brings more iPod iPods. It brings more eyes on our page and um, and more purchases. We're still working on tracking, you know, where all these people are coming from. Um, but our main purchases are our welcome sequence purchases. Or if we're running an email campaign, um, we will get loads more. Someone the other day okay. called them drive-by buyers, which I really liked. <laughs> They um they so just they just like go like, back ah. to your yeah they just go back to your course page on their own or you advertise it. I think whenever we're bringing eyes on, um, whether it be through, through Facebook ads or we're mm. launching another course, we will see much higher purchases on the non-advertised courses as well at full price. Okay, interesting. Uh, the, the reason why is because like $75 off doesn't seem like a huge discount. Um, and I'm like, mm. so like uh, our pricing strategy is to, pri to price high on full price, but not even count on making sales there. Right, um, and then when you run promos, you can run a fifty percent off or something like this. That feels a lot more appealing uh, emotionally, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, but like, it might be different in your business because if people are buying a lot at the full price, then it's more difficult because you will probably kill that by increasing the price. Like, I would charge that price. Like, I I don't like lying to the audience. It's yeah. just a pricing strategy, you know. Yeah, we're very careful to make sure that we are not, you know, inflating prices or anything, um, because we've also we've put higher prices in the past well, recently actually and it didn't work so our, our audience is very price sensitive you're right the 75 dollars if you buy the the lowest tier it is quite a good discount it's like 30 something percent but if you buy the, well, the highest yeah yeah there's no there's no real incentive to go for the, the vip um yeah will who runs all the marketing my husband he um has just taken on a data analyst and they've got a big list of split tests they want to run and nice. that's a huge one um that we want to do because okay. I was, I always favor discounts, as in percentage discounts, rather than simple money off. Because we have all the different plans. Um, so yeah, something to try. Okay. Uh, what was? Do you have an idea of the conversion rate on on your Evergreen funnel? Like you say, you get two percent opt in rate. Then how many people end up buying, basically? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure on that. Um, but I know that it's much lower than average because we we get so many leads. And it's mm. it's a difficult industry as well. And there's a lot of optimizing that we could do um, so much. So if we could get even close to the industry standard, I think we would be buying a mansion. OK, nice. <laughs> uh, try to implement the, the, the two days earlier sell and then uh, I expect a barbecue invitation at the mansion. <laughs> yes, you may. You may come. <laughs> that's, 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 that's all I'm asking for. Um, do you run ads on this funnel? No. Like, do people, people don't get ads. Like, people opt in and they're in an evergreen funnel, they don't get ads? No. It's something that we've got, okay. we've got, we've got a plan for our evergreen funnel ads, but we've only been running ads, um, apart from our little test with the, the lead magnet one before, we've only been running ads on our launches. 
Um, okay. And having moderate success, like we, yeah, it's a, still an untapped market for us, but we're getting these these tripwires in. We're optimizing the um, the funnel, and because I don't want to put money behind something that I know isn't optimized yet. Um, maybe that's a mental block, but it would just pain me to have a low. A low ROAS I on. think uh, yeah. I think you underestimate the power of retargeting. It's quite mm -hmm. uh, we've we've almost never lost money on retargeting campaigns on evergreen funnels. Uh, it's it's I mean it we work in higher value markets like the leads are higher value, so it's easier to make a positive ROI. So I'm not going to tell you it works for sure. Um, <laughs> but if there's one type of ads that is the easiest to run, that would be it. You know, uh, people who have shown high engagement by giving you their email, who are already in a sales sequence and being marketed to. And just essentially what you do is you, you drive up the number of clicks. It's pretty much like triples the amount of clicks you get from your emails Consider it for like a fee, basically. Okay. Consider it that. Uh, it's, it's, it's probably one of the easiest things to do in terms of ads. Even though ads can be complicated, this is the simplest things to do. This is great. I feel like I should be paying you. <laughs> Right well, you, you're being a guest on the podcast, so I guess that's already that's already something. <laughs> um, let's talk about your other funnels because I haven't gone that far. But what happens to me after after I'm done with the Evergreen funnel? You're in my PDF club, so you get my weekly PDFs. Um, okay. Yeah. So every week you get at least one high, super high, super high, because we have interactive activities and everything, super high value email that promotes the YouTube video. It gives you the link to the PDF and it gives you a link to an exercise pack if it's included. And then we run two promos a month on average. I think it's about 20 okay. a year. So we do miss a few months. Um, at the end of each, each month, we promote the next month's monthly challenge, which is a 30 day sometimes 21 day, but normally a 30 day challenge focused on a particular topic like phrasal verbs or idioms or slang or pronunciation. Um, they are lower entry um, or lower price products that we obviously, it creates a nice baseline because we do it every month. And it's what we created first to create kind of cash flow in the business before we then went on to invest in creating the big courses. Um, but you will get a three-day warm-up period that's high value, but it's all about the topic that we will then be promoting. But it's like quizzes, information, nice. value emails. And then we normally do a four-day promo for that. Um, we try to mix value and selling. Um, and then we do our mid-month promos, which are our main bread and butter. It's either a new course launch, if there is one. A new course launch will have a three-week warm-up period sometimes not emails every How do you single day people up? um so for example say we're launching our c1 course we will start doing content at c1 level um little tests to see if you'd be ready to start the c1 level information on what the c1 level is maybe we would create an ebook with everything you know to pass the c1 level and it has basically our curriculum but lots of value in it as well so it's just hyping people up making them aware of what we're going to be selling um but also making it, doing it in such a way that, you know, say someone's never going to be interested in buying, they wouldn't feel annoyed by what they received because it's good stuff. Um, normally for a big launch, three week warm up period, we do sometimes do, we often do an amazing, you know, targeted lead magnet. Um, and then we will sometimes put ad spend behind that, but we it worked really well for our general English courses. For our business English courses, it didn't work so well. So we'll review that for next time. And then it's all, nearly always a one-week promo. Um, Mid-month promos can be anything from three days for, or, you know, maybe we're bundling courses we already have or we're doing a random discount or another angle. Maybe the price is going up. Um, they'll be short or if it's a new launch, it'll be seven days. So, yeah, we send a lot of, a lot of emails. I see that. Um, if I'm like a beginner... And you're promoting the C1 course, the advanced course. Is there a way for me to opt out of this launch or, or I'm just going to be bombarded by emails? Sometimes we offer that option. Um, okay. We're kind of in two minds about it. One thing we do, we never ever email our unengaged audience with promos. And we are getting okay. better at segmenting. Um, so definitely segmenting on people who have bought certain products. If they've bought this B1 course and they're not going to want the C1 course, uh, we could go even further. But sometimes it's hard to know 
whether someone has just accidentally clicked that they are at a low level because mm. it's the first link or if they genuinely are and it's it's like weighing up should I miss the opportunity to make a sale or should I risk you know slightly annoying someone who's at a low level don't know we're not perfect at it yet but I think we could do a much better job at se segmenting so is the is your segmentation based on the level basically so you just like have a a1 b1 c1 etc yes that's the main segmentation okay. we also have based on country as well so if there's okay. a super high price launch we're doing we won't market to india because they're realistically not going to purchase and um they would also generate a lot of customer service queries for example things like that uh, but we're happy for them to be on the list to receive the free content or the lower priced course offerings um so it's about managing a little bit of that as well okay uh i see you're running all the bumps on your checkout how these like did all the bumps make a big impact on your business or like did you not get too much effect from implementing them yeah, we love order bumps. Order bumps normally boost any course launch by 10%. And bear That's in mind, cool. we're running order bumps through Teachable. We use Teachable's checkout. We have tested other checkouts. We have tried to build our own. And the tax, the tax is such a headache um, and things breaking. And we were doing so many launches last year, so many new pages that we just, we had to, we had to prioritize. Um, Fair enough. You cannot optimize or customize, sorry, Teachable's checkout page. It's so annoying. You have no control over it. Um, when we use things like ClickFunnels and Thrivecart and WooCommerce, we had all the control. We got these amazing opt-in rates of like 40% opt-in rather than an average of 30 on a double order bump on Teachable or 20% on a single order bump. Um, but then our taxes are remitted for us. We don't get people who are paying and then not not going in the loop. Web webhooks aren't broke it, breaking. They are getting registered in click in um convert kit. So yeah, it was knowing where to where to cut the losses. Um, but yeah, we love order bumps. They've just released a feature where you can put two in. So we've been using that. Um, I saw it. Yeah, and it's good. Yeah, fair enough. It's, I, I I was gonna say yeah, the checkout. I see you cannot uh, you cannot customize it because mm -hmm. I was gonna say like when you co uh, collect the full address, for example, when it's like a digital product and it's like it's lots of fields to field, etc. And it's like usually when you have more fields, yeah, uh, you have a lower completion rate, etc. But uh, I can understand the tax the tech burden. Uh, people don't know it until they've done like a proper product launch and they make hundreds of sales and you know five percent of sales don't get added to the to the I course know. or something. Oh. <laughs> it's it's a pain in the ass. So it, yeah. it has happened to us. We use Thrivecart and to be frank, it does miss some stuff sometimes. Like yeah. it's just like the hook's not gonna trigger or something. It was the same for us on, on Thrivecart as well. And I feel like mm -hmm. they were gaslighting us saying, No, it's you. And I was like, No, it's they you. Did. <laughs> they did. Like um our product manager absolutely hates them I think. Like, we still use them but like the, because our volume of sales lower like we sell higher prices lower volume so it's like it's kind of like manageable by support like it's it's you know a small percentage of times but i can imagine with you know if you launch tripwires Oof. and you're gonna make like hundreds of sales per day or something uh it's gonna it's not gonna work like you won't be able to manage it so i i feel your pain uh I, i'm actually shopping for a new uh shopping cart right now as well because of strife cart issues actually how do you handle upsells and do you have any upsells after people check out? Do you try to maximize customer value? Like how do you, what happens after I'm a customer for you to make more money off me? So um, upsells have never been so successful for us. Um, okay. Teachable had a terrible upsell system. There was no one click upsell. Uh, they'd have to mm. go through the whole checkout process again. And it was really confusing. Um, they've recently changed it. So they do have it now. So we've gone from a 2% upsell rate to an, 8% or something like that. And they seem to be making about 10% boost. So our total for a promo, 10% is order bumps, 10% is upsells, which we're happy with. Before it was, we were, you know, so disheartened with upsells. However, you've got to remember that we do such frequent promos that people are often always being upsold, upsold to things. Um, so I think it would make sense for someone who does, who relies more on the evergreen funnel and does fewer promos to really optimize the upsells. Um, we are going to do our first big experiment with upsells when we launch our tripwire courses, because they are all courses designed to lead on to purchasing the B1, the B2 or C1 
courses and they will um, mm. have hype videos at the end that will hopefully get people to do a one click upsell. So we'll see. Okay. I mean, for tripwires, yeah, that's kind of the challenge. It's like, mm. it's easy to make a tripwire, but if you don't nail the upsell, it really doesn't make much of a dent in your business. So that's, yeah. that's the double challenge. And it's like, it's easy to be excited by a high number of sales, but in the end, especially if you have ad spend, uh, it's, it's very challenging to, to even make it profitable sometimes. Okay, we're going to slowly wrap it up. So I'm going to finish with a couple of like more opinionated questions to you. So it's mm -hmm. not really like, we're not talking tactics. We're talking about like how you feel towards all that stuff and, and just in general, things that helped you get where you are at right now. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask first, like, what do you think is the best part of your business that you're like really proud of uh, and you feel your head? Oh, the quality of our content. Um, and actually it's the quality of the courses I just, okay. I knew I didn't want to. So back in the day, I worked with a management company and a an agency that created this rubbish course with me. You know, I put my heart and soul into it, but they just didn't have, a, have the knowledge. They were used to working with fitness influencers who just wanted to put a load of workouts on an app or something like that. And I was so disheartened with it a little bit embarrassed as well I felt like I hadn't served my students properly mm -hmm. I swore to myself I'm never ever ever going to put out something that I'm not truly proud of um and something that I'm not able to constantly keep up to my standard so our courses at the moment we released them and they were great but then we went through an audit and got made them even better um made them accessible as well which is really important to us Ooh, that's cool, yeah. um yeah, it was a humbling audit, but it was amazing to have, you know, actionable things that we could put in place to make people use them who are colorblind on screen readers. It was, it was cool. So I'm really, really proud of the quality of our content. I also think the quality of our YouTube content and the lead magnets that go with it are awesome. And I feel really excited to put them out, you know, to such a large audience and to get emails of teachers using them in their classrooms. And yeah, it's really nice. Um, there was a time where I felt a bit really, really nervous. I had some backlash online and people were kind of critiquing my content or, you know, there was some, it was a very sensitive time on the internet, but I really feel like we've now put the systems in place where everything is proofread, multiple layers of proofreading. We've got teachers that are better than I am overlooking everything. And I know that everything we put out is super high quality so yeah i think that's the best part of our business okay now let me ask the opposite question <laughs> what's the worst part of your business and what needs the most work so is this the bit i least enjoy or i think is no nah, what do you think is objectively the worst like uh, external audit someone's like you really need to work on this like this is not good enough oh. which one to pick <laughs> 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 there are so many things that we could work on which is also exciting in its own right because you you know you're not finished yet um you have room for improvement like you can get there and it's exciting to progress like it's cool i'm gonna say two one is our sops systems and processes we uh grew really fast we grew our team really fast and we haven't got all the correct systems in place so a lot of time and a lot of money has been wasted the other one is our damn funnel. It's taken us so long to get something in place. It's not optimized. And yes, I'm so proud of all the courses we've created, but it's at the expense of getting, you know, mm. taking advantage of all these leads that are coming in. I think <clears throat> I have no regrets over doing the courses to such a high standard, um, but I wish I could have, you know, hired the correct people back then because I didn't have enough time to help us set up a proper funnel because it, it would have cost us a bit, but it would have made us a lot more money. Yeah. I mean, I think most companies either are better the product or better the marketing. It's quite rare to, to nail both. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's what we all aspire to, but the reality is you tend to be leaning one way or another. Uh, and, and it's, it, if you've done the product, then, I mean, it's probably better. Like you probably feel better about your business because of that too. So it's not so bad. Yeah. I just feel like it's a bit of a, a drop off because you've got awesome product, awesome lead magnet game, yeah. but then it's just, they're jumping over this huge crevice to get there instead of it being an easy, easy flow. I can, yeah, I can, but there's a lot of room for improvement as well. And you're do already doing quite well. So it's like, this must be exciting. Like the mention is inside, you know? Mm. Um, 
<laughs> One more uh, thing, kind of like a personal thing. People often make fun of my accent or say it's difficult to understand. Like, what grade would you put me at in the English level? Um, I think your accent is charming. Okay. Really charming. <laughs> and it's probably a part of your success as well. You know, you both have interesting accents and like good banter together. Um, your level, oh, you're definitely BC1 or beyond. I mean, you did my test and it obviously put you at C1 level, didn't it? Went down my C1 I final. didn't finish the test. No, I just clicked on the link. So ah, I I you cheated. I, che I cheated. I cheated. <laughs> like, don't, don't. <laughs> no, you speak very, very well. And very fast as well, which is super hard in, a, in another language. It's, it's a problem. I speak too <laughs> fast, actually. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we're not going to go into that. Lucy, thanks for joining the podcast. Do you want to send people anywhere? Or, um, you know, do you want them to follow anywhere? Um, do you know what? I imagine most of your listeners aren't really my audience. So if they do want to download one of my lead magnets, go through my funnel and reply to it with any advice, <laughs> they can do that. Okay. You'll find me on English with Lucy um, on YouTube. That's probably the best way to find a, a lead magnet. I welcome it. Awesome. <laughs> well, thanks for joining, Lucy. That was super nice. Thanks for sharing so much and being so open. And uh, it was really fun. Thank you for such great questions and so much value to me as well. Uh, it was really enjoyable. All right, no worries. <laughs>